Today's lecture is Basic Transmission Genetics 2, and there are two objectives for today. The first thing I want to do is show you how to write out gametes produced by an individual for a dihybrid cross. Remember, dihybrid cross means a cross involving two genes. And then second, I'd like to show you how to write out uh, Punnett squares for a dihybrid cross and explain the results and predict the offspring that would result from such a cross. When we conduct genetics, remember that we only care about the genes that are in the current problem. So this is a given human uh, karyotype. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And if we started looking at genes, if we're talking about a dihybrid cross, we're saying we only care about two of the genes in this organism. And so to give you an example, if we have gene A located on chromosome 11, we're saying, okay, this individual could have two copies of gene A. In this case, they happen to be big A, little a. So they're heterozygous. They could have well just have been big A, big A, or little a, little a. Didn't have to be heterozygous. I'm just drawing that for this problem. Let's say we have another gene on chromosome 15, and this gene is the B gene. So we have big B and little b. Again, just choosing to do heterozygote. If these are the only two genes that we care about in the problem, then these are the only two genes we're going to focus on when we do our cross. Hence, it's a dihybrid cross. Now, always keep in mind that these are not the only two genes that exist in this individual. So there are thousands of genes. Uh, there could be other genes. For example, on chromosome 1, you might have gene C. On chromosome 5, they might have, again, you know, two copies of gene D. In this case, I drew it uh, homozygous recessive just to show you, you know, a different, different genotype. Or if we look at chromosome 6, we might see gene E. You sort of get the idea. In this case, I drew gene E to be homozygous dominant. But there's many, many genes that can exist, but we only care about the two that are in the problem. So keep that in mind. Okay, so let's go ahead and, now that we have that set, let's go ahead and continue and do a practice dihybrid cross. Uh, in a previous video, uh, Transmission Genetics 1, what I did was I showed you a little mnemonic to remember to how go, uh, go about a genetic cross. Uh, remember the sentence, great genetics, please, ooh, stands for first figure out the genotypes of the individuals that are involved in the cross. The second G for genetics is figure out what gametes they produce. What sperm or egg do they produce? The P is Punnett square. Go ahead and draw the Punnett square. And the ooh, gotten a bit juvenile, right? The ooh is ooh, we're having the offspring. And so for a dihybrid cross, you just want to do this procedure twice. Each time you go from one generation to the next, you do great genetics, please, ooh. So, for example, from the parents to the F1, or the P to the F1, F1 being the children, we would do great genetics, please, ooh. If we want to go and go ahead to go to the, um, from the, the children to the grandchildren, we would repeat this process, do great genetics, please, ooh, again. Okay, so let's go ahead and go through the P to the F1, and then we're going to go... Uh, F1 to F2. Uh, I just want to note a little error on the slide I just noticed. So it's always good to you know, hey, make sure you're paying attention, check your notes. First time, P to F1. Second time should be F1, so change that P. should be F1 to F2. Let's go ahead and do this cross for a dihybrid. Okay, so here's an example that you could see. So let's consider two genes, ones we've talked about before with Mendel. So the first gene is Y. Uh, there's two possible alleles you could have for this gene. Big Y encodes for a yellow C pod. Uh, excuse me, yellow seed, and little y encodes for a green seed. Remember, in this case, the large letter is always dominant to the small letter, so uh, the yellow allele is dominant to the green allele whenever we have this problem. The second gene is gene R. And in this case, we're saying, okay, big R is round, little r is wrinkled. So the seeds would look something like this. I chose to make them yellow because I had to give them a color. If I didn't give them a color, they'd be white, which would be fine too, I guess. Uh, but they don't have to be yellow. So more em emphasizing the shape, right? So in this problem, we have two genes. And please also note that we have two characters, right? So one gene, the Y gene over here on the left, tells you what color is the seed going to be. So that's the character, right? Seed color. The second gene, gene R, has a different character. This character is seed shape. Okay, so let's go ahead and continue. Okay, so let's say we start a cross like this, where we cross an individual that has, you know, both these genes, but their homozygous dominant for both of them. Uh, it's just the way we always start our genetics problems. So if their homozygous dominant, they're big Y, big Y, big R, big R. Let's cross them with another organism whose homozygous recessive for both of these genes. So in this case, they're little Y, little Y, little R, little R. Let's go ahead and cross those. Um, 
realize we already started great genetics, please. Ooh, right? We did the great with the genotypes. We wrote them down. Let's do the genetics. Let's figure out what the gametes are going to be. How do we do that? Uh, with a monohybrid cross, it's very, very straightforward. You put one letter in one sperm, the other letter in the other sperm for each letter type, right? Uh, or, you know, one goes in one egg, one goes in the other egg uh, for each letter type. But with a dihybrid cross, we have to look at all the combinations of the letters. So in other words, what we're saying is this. We're saying that each sperm or egg, right, for a given individual, has to have at least one of each letter type. In other words, one R and one Y. Doesn't matter if they're capital case, capital, or if they're lowercase. Doesn't matter for that, right? But it has this one Y, one R, and you cannot have more than one of each. So to accomplish this, you could figure out all the possibilities, which is fine. Or if uh, you want sort of a way to remember it, remember the word FOIL. What the word FOIL stands for is first, outer, inner, last, and it shows you how to make all the possible gametes for a dihybrid cross. Let's look at this in action. First means you take the first Y with the first R. Okay, so that's going to be the first gamete. The, the O means outer in the word foil. So it means the first letter with the last letter. Right, so again, big Y with big R, same outcome, but you could see later it might not be the same outcome. The I stands for inner, the inner two letters, and the L stands for last. In other words, the last Y with the last R. If we foil this out and we do this for this individual on the left, you can see that uh, this is the type of sperm we're going to get. Although we foiled, we did four different things, right? Every single one of those happened to result in a big Y, big R sperm, simply because that's all this individual could yield, right? That's the only thing it could possibly give since it's homozygous dominant. Now we could write big Y, big R four times because there are four different of those, right? But the fact that they're identical to each other, we don't want to do that. Uh, if we did it, it wouldn't be wrong, but it would add more work to our problem. So when you write gametes, so when you're writing sperm or writing eggs, only write novel sperm and novel eggs. If there's redundancies, don't write those more than once. If you foil the organism on the right, this is the type of egg you would get for this organism, right? Little y, little r. Let's do the p, pun and square. We unite those. We get big y little y, big R, little r. And what does that organism look like? Well, if you think about it, if it has one big Y, that's all that matters, right, for the seed color. If it has one big Y, it's got to be yellow, because big Y is dominant to little y. If it has at least one big R, it has to be round, because big R is dominant to little r. So this seed should be round and yellow. And that's what you see what we get. So we took this all the way from P generation to F1, we did great genetics, please, ooh, once all the way through, and we successfully mated organisms and went to the next generation. Now, whenever you do a dihybrid cross, you never stop at the F1 when we do them in genetics class just because you don't see the principle all the way through. That's the only reason. You could stop at F1, but it doesn't demonstrate what we want, want, what we want to demonstrate in class. So let's continue. Let's go from F1 to F2 on the next slide. Okay. So when we do that, what we're going to be doing is we have to, again, foil again, right? We're mating these two offspring here, and we have to go ahead and foil them. Uh, but before we do that, one thing I want to point out, again, sort of a side note, but when you're uh, doing your crosses, so this here is showing you an incorrect way to do the Punnett square that you see here. So I just want to note that this is not correct on the right. This is correct in the middle. But what I want to notice, or I want to draw your attention to is this. When you're making your sperm and eggs, as soon as you make them, draw them. If you put the letters here, right, big Y, big R, draw sperm around those to keep them together. If you don't do that, what a tendency to do is, is you're going to want to chop that sperm a half and take this Y, put it up here, uh, and then, actually I drew this wrong, but you would take this R and put it down here, right? This is this big R. You don't want to do that. Uh, it's not a correct way to do it. Uh, same thing here. If you chop this apart, you would get little y here, so note that error, okay? And then little r over here, like you see. You don't want to chop them in half. Now, if you did do this, how do you know it's wrong? This is how you know it's wrong. If you have two genes in the problem, any sperm or any egg has to have at least one copy of each of those genes. So we have gene y, gene r in the problem. Every sperm better have at least one y and one r. Doesn't matter what the case is, right? 
uh, but they got to have at least one of each. These don't have that, so you know this is wrong. So that's an incorrect cross. Uh, but what you can do is you can avoid that by as soon as you as soon as you foil, draw the gamete, physically draw it to keep those letters together, together, uh, knowing that you can't chop that sperm in half, you can't chop that egg in half. Okay, so let's go forward to continuing this dihybrid cross. Now let's mate the F1 individuals. When we mate them, we're going to foil, right? Go from F1 to F2. If we foil them, we do first, outer, inner, last. If you do that, you see, okay, these are the four sperm that this individual here would produce. Now, if you're not sure how I got it, check that foil, right? First, outer, inner, last. If we do that for the other organism, these are the eggs that this individual would produce. Again, notice they're the same ones, right? They're just eggs instead of sperm, but the same, uh, same alleles are inside. Then what you have to do is go ahead and do P, right? The pun and square. Make your pun and square. So here's the great right? Great is draw the genotypes. Genetic is make the gametes. And then pun and square is the please. Let's go ahead and fill them in. When we fill them in, you'll notice that any organism that has at least one big R, excuse me, one big Y and one big R will be yellow and round. So this egg necessitates or dictates that all of these are yellow and round when you really think about it, right? If you have a big letter, they're dominant to the other letter. So the big Y is dominant to the little Y. The big R is dominant to the little R. <coughs> Excuse me. And they're all going to be round and yellow. And that's what you see going all the way down here. If we fill this in for the other columns, just keep filling them in, you'll see that sometimes we happen to get some that have a little abnormality, right? So, you know, yellow is the most common. This is yellow. But it's little r, little r. There's no big r there. So instead of being round, it's going to be wrinkled. Same for this guy down here. Let's go ahead and keep continuing. Sometimes we'll have the opposite happen, right? Uh, for seed shape, they'll be normal. They'll be round. But for seed color, they'll have little y, little y. And there's no big y. So instead of being yellow, they're going to be green. Fill in the final one here. And you'll notice that here, uh, again, we have all these different versions. But we have this guy down in the corner here. He's something we call the double mutant. Uh, it's a very special phenotype that we're going to keep talking about uh, throughout these lectures. And so what it is, is he's homozygous recessive for Y, right? So he's going to be green, and he's homozygous recessive for R, so he's going to be wrinkled. He's a double mutant there. Whenever we do these dihybrid crosses, once we get to the F2 phenotypic ratio, or excuse me, the F2 generation, we want to say, what's that phenotypic ratio? If you look at it carefully, it's a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. In other words, what that means is 9 of the phenotypes or 9 of the possible offspring are round and yellow, 3 of the possible offspring are yellow but wrinkled, 3 of them are round but green, and then one of them, that double mutant, is going to be green and wrinkled. And that's the ratio that you'd expect to see. If you always foil in the correct order, which I encourage you to do, it's not wrong if you switch the order of these sperm around, but it's awkward. It's going to change the way the problem looks. It's harder to catch errors. So I really encourage you to, to try to foil in the right order and keep those sperm and those eggs in that order. If you do, the double mutant will always be here in the bottom right. This will be one of the single mutants, this sort of pattern right here. And then the other single mutant will be here, here, and here. You always notice it in the same uh, spot on that grid. So it really makes catching mistakes very easy. So I encourage you to foil in the correct uh, direction. Okay, so let's predict the double mutant uh, phenotype. And I see I have a typo on the word phenotype there. So or actually, I didn't separate phenotype and is. So make sure you separate those in the title. Uh, but let's predict the, the double mutant phenotype. Um, and... One thing I want to point out is it's very easy to predict it if each gene affects a different character. Sort of an important point to look at. The key here is a different character. So we had two genes before. We had the Y gene and the R gene. Y affected seed color, R affected seed shape. But they don't really influence each other. So it's very easy to predict the phenotype of the double mutant. But if we have a situation here, and that actually, sorry, excuse me, this is what I did on the last slide, right? So that's two different genes but two different characters so not really hard to predict the double mutant phenotype let's look at a different scenario though so that's easy here's the more complex situation that's coming up okay and so here again two genes two characters not a problem 
this individual here is going to be wrinkled and green, not a problem. Let's look at the opposites. You can see what I'm talking about. What if we have two genes, but we have one character? Uh, not a happy situation. It's harder to predict what that double mutant is going to look like, and it's something we'll talk about throughout these lectures. So let's say gene Y influences seed color, same, you know, uh, different alleles as before. So big Y is yellow, little Y is green, big Y is dominant to little Y. But let's say we have a gene R, but in this case, gene R is not seed shape. Gene R also influences gene color. There's many, many, many characters that are influenced by more than one gene, so we've got to keep that in mind. But let's say gene R influences color also. Let's say big R is yellow, sort of our default, right, our, our wild type, we call it. And let's say little r is white, though. So if you have a little r, it's going to be white. Remember, big r is always going to be dominant to little r. If we do a cross like this, predicting the double mutant phenotype is a lot more difficult. I want to show you what I'm talking about. In this case, how do we know what that double mutant is going to be? You might say, well, what are you talking about? Well, look at this. Little y, little y. That tells you it should be green, right? Okay. Little r, little r. That tells you it should be white. You see how it's confusing to say, well, what is it? It should be green. It should be white. You have two genes affecting one character. Both of these genes, Y and R, are affecting seed color in this shape. And that's a problem because I don't know what to say here. What should it be? Should it be green and white? Should it be a blend between the two, like light green? Should it be striped? Should it be sort of like a speckled pattern of green and white? We don't know, right? We have no idea. We've got to put a question mark there. And the key thing I want to show you here is that you can't always just predict phenotype based on genotype without having some biological knowledge, uh, something we'll touch upon more later. But in other words, if this seed is green, well, okay, it's green, but why is it going to be green if it's little y, little y? What proteins are defective that allow it to be green? Same here. If this is little r, little r, and it's white, what proteins are defective that allow it to be white? Why is it white? And so... By answering those questions, either by looking in the literature or doing your own experiments, then we can have some intelligent reason to predict what this color uh, of this seed would look like. But we don't know, just by the letters alone, if we have two genes, one character. It's just harder to predict. So that's sort of the whole point of this slide. But it's an important discussion to understand. Okay. Um, what I want to show you here is that uh, Mendel had another principle, something called the principle of independent assortment. And you could see that very nicely with a dihybrid cross. And what that shows you is this. So um, each of the characters that are in this cross, right, so one character is seed color and the other character is going to be um, uh, seed shape, each of those characters, the genes for those characters assort independently of each other. So in other words, the gene for seed color has no influence on the gene for seed um, shape. And so you can notice this by this fact. Previously we said we have a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, which you see here. But this is considering both of the genes. If we don't consider both of the genes and both of the characters together, if we just separate them, we say let's look at one gene, one character at a time, we can notice that we get a 3 to 1 ratio that we've seen before with more simple transmission genetics. In other words, Let's look at seed color. Twelve of these seeds you see in this diagram are going to be yellow. Four of them are going to be green. We don't care what the shape is. We're ignoring that, right? But just looking at color, twelve are yellow, four are green. If you simplify that, it's three to one. Same thing for the other character. If we look at seed shape, twelve are going to be round, four are going to be wrinkled. That's also a three to one ratio. Again, in the second one, if we're, if we're looking at seed shape, we're ignoring seed color. So you want to keep that in mind. So the fact that we have these two different independent 3 to 1 ratios where seed color and seed shape are not affecting each other, that's something Mendel called his principle of independent assortment. So that's basic, excuse me, that's basic transmission genetics 2. You want to make sure that you can write out these gametes uh, for a dihybrid cross for a given individual. You definitely want to make sure that you know how to do FOIL. And then finally, you want to know how to execute a pun and square, predict offspring, go completely through a dihybrid problem.